Good evening, New Life Community Church, um, friends from around the United Kingdom and around the world. Um, just want to welcome you to our evening service here at New Life Community Church in Yeadon. Our vision is to love God, love people, and love Yeadon. Uh, we love our coffee as well. Well, I do. Uh, I'm Denver Thompson, the senior leader. And this evening, we're just going to worship and celebrate the goodness of God. Um, we've got a, a good friend of mine uh, with us this evening who's going to be um, sharing the word of God um, on our theme for 2020, which is Seek First uh, from uh, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's just pray to God and then we're going to go into worship this evening. Uh, we're going to decree and declare uh, his goodness and we're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. We just thank you, Lord, this evening. We're able to, Lord, just come into your presence with thanksgiving in our heart, with praise and adoration to you, the King. Lord, I pray, Lord, this evening, Lord, that we'll be able to leave everything at the door, that, Lord, any wor any hurts, any worries, any anxieties, any stresses, any strains in this season that we're in, that, Lord, as we worship you, all of this would, Lord, just go into insignificance. We put you first this evening. Your word says as we lift you high, Jesus the Christ, then you will draw men and women to yourself. So tonight, Lord, we put you in that place of residence tonight and we say, Yahweh, have your way. We pray, Lord, that you would move by your spirit, that our minds would be alert, our hearts would be receptive to what you want to do and what you want to say and what you want to speak tonight. So have your way as we worship you this evening. Come on, church, let's worship God with full vigor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Of the goodness of 
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in a mist. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Hey, we make a miracle walker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We make a miracle walker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who. Hey church, what wonderful worship. You know, it's great to come into his presence and uh, the Bible says to worship him in spirit and in truth. Wasn't that wonderful worship that we just enjoyed just now? I know for myself that I've been so engulfed in that worship and so thrilled to be able to worship my Saviour and my Lord. I know that we're not together in an auditorium right now or in a church building, but we are together. Emmanuel, God with us, unites us 
and uh, brings us together. Well, this evening, um, it's my delight and my honour and my privilege to um, have um, James Cowan with us all the way from Atlanta, Georgia in the USA. Um, his wife Peggy and their five children have become dear friends to me over the last few years and is a man of integrity, man of the word, um, a man who loves God, loves people. And I know this evening that he's going to bring a significant word to us uh, based on Seek First, which is our theme for this year. So sit back, grab yourself a tea and a coffee, relax and let God speak to us as a church, as individuals and more than anything else, that our minds be alert and our hearts be receptive to what God wants to say. Please enjoy yourselves and let's listen to what God wants to say to us this evening. Good evening. I want to say hello to everyone at New Life Community Church in Yeadon and Pastor Denver Thompson, a great man of God. I met with him many times. I know his heart. I know where he stands as far as the things go, the kingdom of God. And it is great to be with him tonight and his congregation. Can you say amen? These are different times that we are in today and different times call for, for different methods of getting the gospel outside of the four walls of the church. And praise God for technology so that we can do that. So that no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, no matter what's going on in the world, you can still have the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the kingdom of God brought to you in your homes. Can you say amen? Dear Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We just ask you to bless this Bible study tonight, Father. We ask you to bless this congregation. We ask you to bless these people, Father. And Lord, all of those that are around the world hurting right now, Father, we just ask you to begin to move in their lives, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. When I talked to Pastor Denver and he had talked to me about speaking, he told me that you had been speaking out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The first question I always ask when I, when I look at that scripture, number first and foremost, is why is it important to seek? Here the word seek is an action. That means you're not idle. That means you're not sitting. It means you're not doing nothing, but you're doing something and you're seeking the kingdom of God. And if you're seeking the kingdom of God, you're seeking his presence because you're not going to have the kingdom of God without the presence of God. Can you say amen? James 4 and 8 says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. So in our seeking, we begin to draw near and in our drawing, God responds. Our seeking requires a response from the Father according to James chapter 4 and verse 8. So as you begin to seek the kingdom of God, you begin to seek his presence, you begin to go after those things of his kingdom, then he begins to draw nigh unto you. And when you're seeking and he's drawing, the two will meet together. Can you say amen? When we are driven by the presence of God, he responds. I promise you today your seeking will not go unanswered. The question I have for you today is this. What is actually driving you to seek? What is your motivating factor behind seeking the kingdom of God? And, it, and at first we would all think the response would be the correct response. But we see time and time and time again in the kingdom of God that a lot of times we have agendas and self-motivation purposes, self-motivational purposes that drive us into seeking the kingdom of God. But what we, don't fail, what we fail to realize is this, that God knows the motivation behind our heart. God knows the reason for our seeking. God knows what's driving us to seek what we're driving. Are you driven by your job, your family, your relationship? Are you driven by jealousy, offense, tithe, anger? Are you driven by presence, kingdom, harvest? Are you driven by a title within the church? If any of those response is your response, then you fail because the only thing you should be driven by is the presence of God. Being in his, in his presence, being face to face with the Father. As Moses said, show me your glory. That too should be the cry of us, the believers. Whether you're in the United States or whether you're in England where you're at tonight, it doesn't matter. What should be the determining factor in what's seeking us and driving us should be his presence. Can you say amen? There are many biblical examples of people that were driven to seeking after God. The woman with the issue of blood was driven to touch the master. Blind Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus and couldn't see. Zacchaeus climbs a tree. 
All three of those were driven by one thing. What? To be in the presence of Christ because they knew that something life-changing was going to happen if they could just get in his presence. Paul on the road to Damascus was transformed by the presence. The prodigal son returned home. Why? To be in the presence of his father. As a matter of fact, the prodigal son makes the statement, I don't care if I just have to be a servant in your kingdom, just to be in your presence, just to be where you are at is enough for me. Moses declared, if your presence doesn't go with us, then I won't go. These people had a determination to be in the presence of God. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7 says this, the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Now when you go and you begin to research that, set my face like a flint, the, 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 the definition that means to be determined. To be determined to get somewhere. There are many times in my life that I have set my face like a flint because I had a level of determination, a will to get something done. I, I've heard that you hear the phrase a lot of times, he willed himself to accomplish the task that he wanted to accomplish. He was determined to get to that place, determined to see, take place in his life what he wanted to see. So Isaiah says here, set his face like a flint. In our seeking, we must begin to come to a level of determination, to, to a level of setting our place like a flint that nothing can sway, persuade us to stop going after the presence of God. I believe it was Job that said, though he slay me, yet I will still serve him. Yet today, our determination, our seeking has wavered in a place that we're no longer, no longer going after the presence of God with the determination that all hell itself might come against me and I will stop. Philippians 3 and 14 says this, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We must become determined that it must be the presence of the Father at all cost. At all cost. The secret place, communing with the Father, being intimate with Him, hearing the mysteries of the kingdom of God that He wants to, to, to impart into us, but if you don't have a determination in your seeking, you will do what I call settling instead. There are a lot of believers in the kingdom of God that have quit seeking after the kingdom of God and have begun, and begun to settle for what they determine to be a satisfactory secondary consequence of their seeking. Settling will not get you what you're seeking. Settling means I don't have the determination I'm beat, I'm tired, I'm giving up, and I'm going to take this second place trophy, this second place prize, and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to settle for it. But let me tell you something. There is no second place trophy. There is no second ribbon. There is no second prize. There's only one. There's only one. There's only one place that you need to be determined to finish, and that's what you're seeking after, not settling. Can you say amen? First Peter 5 and 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking who he may devour. Satan will not sit back and give up his battle for your soul. When you begin to have a level of determination and a level of perseverance in your seeking, the storm is going to come. The enemy is going to come against you. The enemy is going to attack you. If you are in a level of seeking and a level of perseverance and going after what you are going after, the presence of God, and the storm isn't rising up, then you need to take a step back and begin to question the motive and the agenda behind your heart as far as what you are going after. Because what Satan brings into our lives to try to stop us from our seeking and from our perseverance and from our determination are things that everyone is familiar with, and that is distractions. Satan will bring distractions into your life that will take you right out of your seeking and into your settling. Distraction, the definition of the word, a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. A thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. Now, I have five distractions in my life. They are named Sierra, Alyssa, Jimmy, Elijah, and Jude. Those are my five children. 
But there's a difference between those distractions and the distractions that Satan might bring into your life. And a lot of times the, the distractions that Satan brings into your life are going to lead to things like jealousy, anger, bitterness, offense in your life. And when these distractions come into your life and you begin to experience those emotions, you begin to experience those things, immediately that's when you should begin to take a step back because you have to begin to recognize where that begins to be sown into your life, where that seed is coming from. God doesn't bring jealousy. He doesn't bring fear, anxiety. He doesn't bring offense into your life to question you. Those come from the enemy. Those are the distractions that Satan tries to bring into your life to keep you from seeking after the presence of God. The level of your commitment toward your seeking will determine the level of your distraction the enemy is going to put into your path. And so I go back to what I said a few minutes ago. If you're not receiving any distractions, if you're on cruise control rolling right on down the road, you may want to pump the brakes a little bit and put it in park and begin to question what is going on that Satan's giving me a free ride with what I think God has called me to do instead of actually having a distraction trying to keep me from getting to the place that God needs me to get to. Distractions have consequences and cost us vision. When we become distracted, it actually costs us our vision. We begin to see things that aren't as if they are. If you will turn with me to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. I'm going to read verses 23, 24, and 25. And this is out of the King James Version of the Bible. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did I not serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? When we are intimate with our distraction, it costs us our vision. Who or what is around you that is affecting your ability to see based off the distractions they are bringing into your life? Who have you come into to relationship with? Who have you allowed into your life that is causing a distraction that is costing you vision and causing you to be intimate with something that God never intended for you to be intimate with? Who is in your life that is taking you away from the things of the kingdom of God that God has intended for you? Because they have distracted you and your vision is no longer on the prize of the high calling. Your vision is no longer for the things of the kingdom of God. But they have been in distraction and have pulled you to the wayside. And you have allowed yourself to be intimate with that distraction. And allowing yourself to be intimate with the distraction. You have kept yourself from the thing you initially longed for. You have kept yourself from the initial person that you wanted to be intimate with. They have kept you apart from that which you wanted to wed and be in relationship with. Why? Because you've given into the distraction instead of taking place, instead of knowing intimately that which you desire, that which you are longing for. How could Jacob not see that he had settled for something? There's that word settled again, that he had settled for something related to his original passion, but not quite his original passion. There are many people out there in ministry that aren't doing what they had a vision for to begin with or, or they have stepped aside and stepped back from that which God has called them to because they became intimate with the distraction and now they've engulfed themselves in the distraction and are no longer passionate for that which they initially longed for, that which they were initially called for, that which God initially anointed them to do, but instead they've settled for something else and because of it, while they're settling, their initial passion is still walking out there looking for a bride. Leah is not what Jacob originally burned for. What are we settling for that may be related to what we started pursuing, but is actually a substitute that could never replace our original longing? Don't settle for instant gratification with Leah, but rather endure for your original passion and recover your longing at any cost. If God called you to preach, be passionate about preaching, but don't settle to be a worship leader because at least now I'm doing something in the kingdom of God. 
Now, when, when, when your apostle or, or, or your pastor, whoever is, is over your house, he says, look, you're called to preach and I'm mentoring you and I'm raising you up. But in the meantime, while I'm mentoring you, I need you to do this. You do what you're asked to do, but you don't ever lose sight of the initial vision. There are steps that you take to get to the initial vision, but don't get to the place where you become so intimate with that which you have put off on the side that you cast off the original vision. You will always linger for what you genuinely long for. We don't have a lingering problem in the church. We have a longing problem. The church's obsession with the clock is really a secondary consequence of an insufficient obsession with eternity. Most of us have failed in the pursuit of what we were originally passionate about because we did not understand that it may be a lifelong pursuit. In order to withstand a lifelong pursuit of his presence, we must be able to stand victorious in the area of determination. We must be able to stand victorious in the area of determination and become an overcomer in the arena of distractions. Become an overcomer in the arena of distractions and become victorious in the area of of determination. Can you say amen? We must not allow distractions in our life to begin to birth other distractions. Because what happens when one distraction, we become intimate with it. Then we begin to birth offspring from the initial distraction. And now we have many distractions. Have you ever heard the old, the old phrase people say, you know, one lie versus another lie versus another lie versus another lie. And I've heard people say, Boy, well, man, he can't even keep up with the lies that he's had. Well, it's the same way with our distractions. We allow one distraction to lead to another, to another, and to another. And the next thing we know, we've fallen so far away from what we originally longed for, we don't even remember what we originally longed for until one day we see it walking down the road, intimate with someone else. Don't allow your distraction to birth a generation of unfulfilled promises in your life. It was that which was birthed from an inferior relationship with Leah that would one day sell the dreamer, Joseph, into captivity. Now, what does God want to do in your corporate body? What does God want to do in New Life Community Church? Are you being intimate with Leah? Or have you pushed those distractions to the side and continued longing for your original longing? Are you still longing for the vision that God has birthed in the church? Are you still going after that, which, which your pastor had given? As the scripture says, write the vision on the tablets, present it to the church, present it to the people. And I know that God's got a vision for New Life Community Church there in Eden. And I believe that God's saying, don't allow the distractions that are coming into your path. Keep you from the initial passion. Keep you from the initial vision. Keep you from the Rachel that I have in your sights. But keep your eyes set on the that which he hath called you, that which he hath told you, that which he hath birthed through your body and into your corporate body. Keep your eyes set on that and eliminate the distraction and you will see those things come to pass in your church. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. Be ye steadfast, unmovable. Your labor is not in vain. Sometimes we don't see the finished product right in front of our face, so, so we tend to walk away and allow the distractions to come. We allow the distractions to keep us from that which God wants us to get to. I, I remember there was a, there was a time where, where my, my wife and my kids, they had a puzzle, and it was like a 1,500-piece puzzle. And they would work diligently on this thing and they would ask me to come in and sit down and do the puzzle. And I might sit there for an hour with them and get one piece while they're locking all these thousands of pieces of this puzzle together. And, and it just didn't hold my attention. It didn't hold my interest. And I would consistently have to grab the box to look at the picture to match it up with the piece of the puzzle I have and set it down. See, I was picking up with that box to refresh myself with the vision of what the completed puzzle was supposed to look like. 
But too many times we don't pick up that box in the corporate body and look at the puzzle and get that fresh look at the vision to see what it looks like. And so we're trying to put pieces places that we don't have a comprehension of because we've lost sight of the vision because distractions have come into our life and have kept us from seeing it. Sometimes the church just has to do a reset on the vision and pull out the picture and look at it again and have it brought back to our remembrance that which God has called the, the specific corporate body to. That which God has called New Life Community Church in Eden to. What's your vision? Do you need to pick the puzzle box back up and take a look for a refresher so that you can begin to begin again to be unmovable and steadfast in all that you do? Zechariah 4.10 says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. For he says, Who hath despised the day of small things? You might be small in your mind. In your mind, you might not be a church of 10,000 people. You might only be a church of 150. You might only be a church of 100 or a 50 only. But God says, do not despise the day of small beginnings, of small things. Don't despise the time when you're small because everything started small. Every building started with a single stone before it became a skyscraper. Every ship started with a small corner before it became into a massive ship. Everything starts in a small place and then grows. You can't despise those days of being small and cast out the vision after a few weeks or after a few months because you're not seeing the results that you want to see. When I sat down at the puzzle, I was terrible at the puzzle. I didn't see the results I wanted to see personally myself. But as my, my, my wife and my children and as a family unit, we began to put the pieces in place or they began to put more pieces in place than I did. I will say this. They probably did 99% of the puzzle. But the day came when there was only one piece left and I walked in and they would kind of tease me about it. And they said, Dad, we saved the last piece for you. And as I put the last piece into that puzzle, the picture became complete. You might not know what your position is. You might feel like you're doing nothing. But know this without what you're doing through your determination to see the vision fulfilled in New Life Community Church without every single person there's going to be a piece missing out of that puzzle of the vision that God has for your body but once your piece goes into its place it's been locked in and all hell itself can come against your body all hell itself can come against the church but it can't take that puzzle out of the take that piece out of the puzzle away from the vision that God has planned for you can you say amen don't stop seeking because you've settled. Be steadfast, be determined in all that God has for you. The scripture we started out with, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this night, Lord. And God, I just ask you to touch everyone right now, God, in New Life Community Church, Father. Everyone in, in that body there in Eden, Lord, that, that is watching this tonight, Father, just begin to, to permeate their, 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 their homes right now with your presence, with your spirit, Lord. Just, just allow your spirit to come into the very rooms that they are at right now, God, and begin to touch them and begin to open up their eyes, God, so that they begin to see the vision clearly. That, that there might be times when distractions have come along, God, but that they refuse to settle as a corporate body. They refuse to settle as a church, but they're going to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. They're going to keep forging on. The enemy might have brought something into the path of the church that, that has shuttered churches out of their buildings, but God, you cannot shutter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is going, is covering, is covering the earth as the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, Father. It cannot be stopped. The kingdom of God is moving on, Father, and I ask you to touch every individual in this body tonight, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. I want to thank everyone at New Life Community Church there for, for listening tonight. And, I, and again, I want to thank Pastor Denver Thompson for giving me the opportunity to share. God bless you. You are in my prayers. Oh, whoa. James, thank you so much for that word. That is a word in season. You know, I just spoke to James a couple of days ago over Easter. And we just had a very brief chat. Just asked him about his family, asked him about his ministry. 
and I just explained that we were on the theme this year of seek first the kingdom of God. And the next thing he contacted me a day after, he said, hey, I've put a, a sermon together that I felt God laid on my heart. And could I drop box it to you? And I don't know about you, but I felt that there's a word in season. I know for myself and the leadership several times already this year, we've talked about the unprecedented and we've talked about distractions. And many times it's about Jesus plus, a little bit like the iPhone plus when we need to declutter we need to reset, reevaluate, repent, and realign, and refocus, and seek first the kingdom of God. We thank you for listening today. Uh, we're going to go out with a song this evening, and we'll be back again on Sunday morning at half past ten. Where we'll be opening up the Word of God and going into seek first a little bit more over the next few weeks, as we feel that is still on our heart, even in the season that we're in. And I find it interesting beginning this year that God spoke to me about prioritizing and seeking first God's kingdom. Just to say, if you would like to give and you're willing to give, um, maybe you're watching this from around the world and you'd like to sow into New Life Community Church, into the ministry, uh, then our bank details are on the screen. Also, we have a building fund. We're in the process of taking on the building, the facility that we rent at the moment. And so there are many legal fees and the upkeep of the building. So if you'd be willing to invest into the ministry of New Life Community Church, uh, please uh, give uh, freely, give willingly, uh, give generously. Um, there is no expectation on you giving. The details are on the screen. Be blessed in everything that you do. We love you, believe in you and standing with you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Set.